empower black men to live extraordinary lives. Shadow the stereotypes. Power black men. Power black men. Shadow the stereotypes. Power black men to live extraordinary lives. Shadow the stereotypes. Shadow the stereotypes. Power black men to live extraordinary lives. Welcome to Shatter the Stereotypes, where the intention is to empower black men to live extraordinary lives. This show is based on the simple idea that every black man is capable of creating inner peace, dynamic health, great relationships, and financial abundance. Therefore, we provide insights and strategies to educate, motivate, and inspire black men to reach their full potential and create the life of their dreams. So if you're ready for some high octane motivation and inspiration that supports and empowers you to live the life you were born to live, get ready to shatter the stereotypes so you can build a life that lights you up and positively impacts the world. So now let's shatter the stereotypes with your host, Coach Michael Taylor. Welcome to Shadow the Stereotypes, where the intention is to empower Black men to live extraordinary lives. You see, there's never been a shortage of Black male role models. There's only been a lack of exposure of those role models in mainstream media. So my goal is to showcase and highlight Black men who are doing remarkable things in the world. And join me today is a man who is doing just that. His name is Wayne Dawson, and he's a transformational and strategic mindset coach. I love the title. I love, love, love the title. And he empowers men to move through life challenges so they can create lives of joy, passion, and purpose. So what's up, Wayne? Welcome to Shadow the Stereotypes. How are you doing today? Brother Mike, thank you so much for having me. I am doing just simply marvelous. And how are you, brother? Oh, man, I'm ready to rock and roll. You know what happens when you get two like-minded brothers together, man. So we're going to have a dynamic conversation. So before we jump into your coaching, though, let's start off with a few icebreakers. So first of all, tell us where you're from and tell us a little bit about growing up. What was that like for you? All right. So that's easy. It's uh, from the beaches to the boardroom for me, man. So I started out in Jamaica where uh, I was raised by a very loving family. And that is my <clears throat> a lot of people talk about their broken past. And I understand that. But for me, my superpower was the strength of family. My father uh, was married to my mom for over 40 years before he died by a massive heart attack on her lap. And I have two sisters that are older than me, Delaine and Vivine, uh, one five years, one 12. And they've given me nothing but unconditional love throughout my life. So I was the baby, the pampered boy. And my father uh, was a drill sergeant, so to speak came up with the uh, discipline of the belt to the butt. And uh, that was very, you know, that was in at the time, apparently, because a lot of parents that I knew raised their kids with that. Um, though I don't raise my kids that way myself, I am grateful for the intent behind the discipline. And I never saw it as abuse. Um, there were issues with me as a teenager with my dad where I, you know, pushed back because I wanted to sneak girls in the house and he wouldn't allow me. And so, at a tender age, I moved out and went to Oterias, uh, the hotel industry, uh, enamored, I was enamored by it. One of the things that I will share real quickly is the idea of collaboration and inclusiveness that I learned very early. My father, you see, uh, I would wake up to see hordes of men in my living room at the dining table as he spread out papers on the table that were uh, uh, blueprints. We don't use that anymore, but back in the day of building houses, he was a building contractor. He would have these blueprints, which were, um, you know, architectural framework for every building he did. And so he would have different people representing different uh, artisans, masons, plumbers, carpenters, all there giving their input. And that was the first introduction of group thinking collaboration that I saw. And when I went to Oterias, I became part of a movement of all inclusive resorts working for couples resort. Um, and then that was in the eighties, all inclusive was not a big thing today. You and your wife or uh, whomever you travel with would go to a vacation or a cruise, you enjoy all inclusive. We were not doing that then as much. And so I saw where there was a one shop all sort of experience. Fast forward, I got to New York and um, 
finished college in New York. And my first jo job, one of my first jobs was with the Children's Aid Society. Again, an all-inclusive as it were, because it had a multidisciplinary uh, things for children and youth to do in one stop. You know, they got their education taken care of, their recreation taken care of. They had uh, mentoring. Uh, you name it, it was all there. Social services, physical, mental, dental services. And I, I continued my journey throughout experiencing those collaborations. And so one of the things that I quickly recognized is that we just can't do it alone. No matter what it is, I have seen success modeled through major collaborations rather than um, the idea of conflict and competition. So that has brought me around to this. And, and that's the intention of the Shadow the Stereotypes movement collaboration and empowerment for black men. So again, I'm really honored and glad you joined me for this particular podcast. So name a book that you love and tell me why you love it. The Four Agreements. Ah. Yes. Yeah. Don uh, Don uh, Don I love that book because it speaks to some real divine concepts. And I, I mean divine as in deep within us. Everything that we do in this life truly is an agreement, right? There are no laws that are out there that we must apply to ourselves unless we agree to them. And in the four agreements, uh, Miguel Ruiz talks about, let me, let me just quickly give them to you. Um, he talks about don't take, any, don't take anything personally, right? How many of us wind up doing that, Michael? Everything is personal. It all begins with the I am. <laughs> yeah. And he talks about the impeccableness of your word. If you can't believe in a man's word, then you got nothing to hold on to. He talks about not making assumptions. Don't make an ass of you and me, right? And we do that every single day, just about, it's hard. And then he talks about always doing our best. I like that. And I've given away more copies of that book outside of Think and Grow Rich, which is one of my favorites as well by Napoleon Hill, to mentors and, uh, and colleagues more than anything else that I've given away. Great choice, great choice. One, one of my all-time favorites also. Now, you like movies? Uh, I'll tell you I do, but I can't tell you a lot about them weeks after, but there's one that stands out, and that is, believe it or not, 1993, the movie um, Indecent Proposal. Mm-hmm, oh yeah, yes. Remember yeah. that one, remember yeah. that one well. And that stands out for me, Michael, because, uh, all of us have a selling point, a place where we sell out, a place mm -hmm. where our value system can be traded in for something else. And that something else is not always a million dollars as in that movie, yeah. uh, but it's, it's something else. And so that's a life lesson for me. And uh, it, it resonated. Now, if you have not seen the movie, in the movie, this guy proposes, he wants to give this guy a million dollars to sleep with his wife. You know, so that's... that's it, it, like I said, there's, there's less, I believe movies are just metaphors for life, right? So yes, like, when we look at movies, we can learn a lot about ourselves. And so we, we, we tend to lean toward things that really resonate with us. So for me, that movie, again, is about being 100% responsible and accountable for your choices. Yes, sir. And knowing that we always have the power to choose. So it's, a, it's actually a really good movie, actually, by the way. I love it. Now, as a man who happens to be black, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future in general? I'm optimistic. Um, I think everything has a season. And I mean, our season has been long off <laughs> uh, to celebrate victories, but there are victories, even though oftentimes we don't see them uh, or, or we don't acknowledge them. And that's part of the training that we've had with a worldview that uh, we're not partially responsible for shaping. We, we don't tell our own stories. And so we have to be responsible for the narratives. We have to be responsible for the stories about ourselves. And so I think you can see even the last year with the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, there was a lot of um, what we call alliances and allies, uh, which if, if, if you really paid attention uh, they weren't people who looked like us all over the world. So I think people are waking up to the fact that this old guard has to die and die hard. Um, you know, 
I think with the advent of social media and the internet, what is happening is that folks are getting an opportunity to see what's happening across the other side of the fence and realizing that, you know, we have more in common than differences um, is happening. In my own family, Michael, my kids, uh, it's like the United Nations when we get together to eat. You know, everybody comes in representing a different nationality in terms of spouses and relationships that are happening. Yeah. Well, my tagline and my belief is there's never been a better time to be alive on the planet than right now. I love that. And um, I consider myself to be an irrepressible optimist with a passion for the impossible. Um, because I, I believe that I believe there's a divine intelligence that created and is still creating this amazing universe we live in. Yes, sir. And when we get in alignment with this divine intelligence, nothing is impossible. Right. And that's one of the things that drives my optimism, um, knowing that I have access to this intelligence that allows me to be, to do, to have anything I set my mind to. I agree. So I want to begin with a question for the audience. So as you're watching this, I want you to really ponder this question. Are you genuinely happy with your life right now? I am. I'm contented. I'm happy. And um, I'm not satisfied that that is the end. Uh, there is more. Life begins for me. I'm, I'm going to be 59 in a matter of days, actually, Michael, uh, August 16th. And I recognize that what has gone before has only prepared me for what is about to come. And so... I, I know there's more, you know, there's fire under my tail, but I, where I am, I'm happy, but I'm forever working at uh, greater, I guess, playing out of my purpose. Yeah, yeah, that's important. So, so now I want the audience to take a moment and just think about that question. So as you're watching this right now, you, the audience, ask yourself that question. Are you genuinely happy with your life right now? Now, also, this is for the audience. Audience, I want you to think about this. Take a moment and think about your health. Are you happy with your overall health? Now, I want you to think about your intimate relationships. Are they rewarding and fulfilling or are they full of drama and stress? And what about your finances? Do you have enough money so that you don't stress out about it? And last, but definitely not least, think about how you feel right now. What is the state of your emotional health? So is it possible for you to have inner peace, dynamic health, great relationships, and financial abundance? I say the answer is yes. And if you're currently unhappy, with any area of your life right now, it's time for some coaching. Because every black man is capable of creating an extraordinary life if he's willing to put forth the effort. So Wayne, you ready to do a little coaching? Yes, sir. And Michael, <laughs> if I can add, I believe that it is our birthright, all men of color, all men, to have a state of fulfillment and significance. Absolutely, absolutely. So. Wayne, I have come to know that there are only two things that will cause a man to want to change. One is pain, and the other is what I call divine discontent, which just means that there's just an inner feeling that something's just not right in our lives. So I'm curious, what triggered you to begin your inner journey of transformation? Was it pain or was it divine discontent? Oh, man, it was awful pain, Michael. I, I um... Like a lot of us, I lived that imposter life, you know, and uh, pretended I had a great job at the time. And uh, to the outside world, you know, this brother looked together, but um, I had had an affair close to my 40s, the same issue that I talk about, midlife crisis, uh, with a younger woman. And um, one that I had come to really admire, and it resulted in my last son. So I have three kids with my ex and then this, uh, my last son. By the way, we don't consider him half and he doesn't consider himself half. 
the family, he spends time with me and my family, sometimes with them and my ex more than with me. Uh, so anyway, the point I'm making is at about the time when this was happening, we were buying a home and um, it became evident that I was having the affair and the affair ended. Um, but my wife also revealed during that period that she was moving on because she was gay. She announced that she was gay. And so this was quite, uh, I don't know. I, I, I put it this way. I spent over a year in therapy. I lost within six months, about 30 pounds. Wow. I was totally devastated. And I owned a lot of that. And yet I couldn't own it all because she had to be who she had to be. So we were both living lies, I guess. Mm. You know, and at the end of the day, Michael, my kids were beginning to grow up. And the hardest part to me was not being in the house to hear my kids breathe at night and to put a little Vicks on them and to hold them when they couldn't sleep. Cause I was that kind of doting dad. Every time you saw me, I had my children with me every time. Um, and so being absent from the home sort of made me wonder about my values and my worth and my responsibility as a father you know, preside and protect and provide. And, and, and one of the things that I had to do, Michael, is I had to reconcile with self first. And I did that through not only the therapy, seeking help and sharing with people who I loved and who loved me, my pain, but also to commit that from that day onwards, I would be a very faithful and loyal man to whomever I had a relationship with. And also because I needed to have my kids, my, my daughters recognize that that was the only way a relationship was going to be healthy when they got into it. And my sons needed to understand that there was no awards or celebration for sowing your wild oats if somebody believed in you and trusted in you and committed to you and you in them. And so from that day onwards, um, that was the milestone of a renewed me. But I also experienced and uh, having every celebration for all my four children, all of the mothers involved, including my current wife, at the table for every event. And they, we spent time at each other's homes. And that's because I made it a point of duty to be a stand-up dad. You know, I had to, uh, it wasn't so much about the resources because I was juggling keeping together three homes at times. So it was about the resourcefulness. If, if for example, on a Saturday morning, the lawn needed cutting at my home in Queens that I had uh, left for the family, I would go cut it instead of having a landscaper come in, I would take my ex's car to the garage, get the oil change, service, do it myself, wash it myself. And there were things that I just had to step up and do. And so my friends would say, how do you do that, bro? How do you have on the one roof, you know, as it were, your two baby mothers, but one, you know, and, and your wife, and it's all cool. And I realized that this was probably novel to a lot of brothers. And so I wanted to help families stay together, no matter what, in terms of the involvement of the fathers, of us as men. That's our responsibility. It's an assignment when you are a father. It's not a, uh, an option to be involved. Yeah. Now, I love the quote on your website that says you went from broken to awoken. <laughs> yes, sir. That, that, that transformational process where we wake up. Yes, sir. And so you mentioned that, number one, you were courageous enough to go to therapy to start addressing and dealing with some of the emotional stuff that was driving your behavior. But what were some of the other things that you've done that has allowed you to wake up? Well, you know, I, I noticed that um, for men, I came from, I am from a very uh, male dominant uh, society, Jamaica. There's a lot of machismo and the brothers in Jamaica typically have a sense of privilege because, you know, the woman has a place. And uh, I recognize because of all the strong women in my life and, you know, in corporate America here in Florida, when I moved from New York, I worked in a environment where I would say when I started there were probably 80 something percent female around me. I managed a team of uh, corporate trainers, um, maybe what, 20 folks, and I was the only male in the department. And, and I quickly recognized the power of women. And outside of that, Michael, 
talking about being awoken, when you go back in history, men, uh, Think and Grow Rich speaks about this in one of his chapters, men at perhaps the age of 40, when they have a significant other woman in their life begin to truly flourish. There's something about us as men when we get settled and start dedicating our love on our energy and uh, our, our intent on one human being, uh, in this case, my, my current wife or the woman in my life, that blessings and riches seemed to come to us in more ways than one. And these things began to happen the minute I started taking a new lease on life. For me, I started seeing abundance in all areas. I started recognizing that by loving and respecting myself at a greater level, that there was more love and respect for everybody else around me. And so I, I, I needed to put that into effect and to do work on it. Yeah. Now, I wrote a book called The Cure for Onlyness, A Black Man's Guide to Joy, Passion, and Purpose. And the book addresses the feeling that we as Black men sometimes experience when we're in situations where we're the only person of color in the room. So I know you've had that experience. So I'm curious, how do you deal with, or how have you dealt with that experience? I'm not intimidated by it. In fact, I seek it as an opportunity to be regal, to wear my crownship, to be a king, to, to represent, because then at that point, I'm not representing just me. I'm thinking about my father before me. I'm thinking about my sons behind me. I'm thinking about you. And so I show up and show out. And that is to say, I give them my best. Yeah. And let, and let that speak for you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Give them your best and let that speak for you. Yes, so that, sir. That, that was the whole intention of the book, to let Black men know that no matter what environment you're in, when you bring your full self, when you bring your gifts and talents to that room, you can transform that room by being who you are. Yes, sir. So that's a really powerful place to be. So we as Black men, we must have the confidence in ourselves to step into those environments and not be, number one, intimidated, yes, sir. not be afraid, and to know that we belong there. And you know what? They're looking, Michael. They're Absolutely. looking and making their judgments and calibrating looking at you. Absolutely. You walk in and they've already got their judgments and uh -huh. you before you even open your mouth. But then when you open your mouth and you shine, it, it changes their perception. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> you know, that's, that, that's how I approach being a black man. I see myself as a representative. And when I show up as a representative, people go, yeah, I want to be a part of that. So that's, I agree. that's just the way I do it. So now you, you focus primarily on black men, men of color, which is wonderful. And that's the whole platform that I'm on. And obviously, in doing so, we're not excluding men of other races. See, that's, right. that's the thing some people think. We're not excluding. But see, what I found was a couple of reasons. Number one, as an entrepreneur, it said, it said that, you know, find a need and feel that need. So for me, I found a need, which was personal development programs and products for Black men, because there were very few. Yes. And so I've been writing since 1995, right? So you primarily focus on Black men, but I'm curious. Black men, generally speaking, shy away from, don't participate in things like therapy, coaching, personal development programs. Right. So what, what has been your experience or acceptance of Black men and your coaching business? You're absolutely correct. Black men see that as a sign of weakness. Yes. The vulnerability is something that, you know, and unfortunately, Michael, um, I am, my wife is a clinical psychologist and we're going to do some work together because we're recognizing as people come to see her, black men in particular, the question they ask their significant other is what am I supposed to do now? Because there's an old thinking that uh, our work is to provide and protect and with women stepping up today, you know, and, and we have, for the most part, felt impotent by a society that beats us down, we, we no longer know what our role is. 
the woman today can oftentimes be outnumbering us in the marketplace and make more money. So what about provision? So I, I'm thinking it's really to preserve and preside. That is the way that I'm looking at part of how we go to work today as black men, our role. And um, presiding is really to lead. And preserving really has in it the idea of also protecting and all of that because it's really preserving the legacy of who you are, who your family is and so forth, but it's difficult. And so a lot of the work that I'm looking at now is how do I engage black women in a friendly way and non-threatening way to encourage their men to be a part of the change. And you know, you talked about pain or pleasure. Uh, most of us are active in terms of making changes when there's pain, the, the, the need to move away from pain, not so much the, the want to move towards pleasure. And uh, I hate to say it, but we are and have been under a lot of pain. You know, Maslow says it in the first two tiers of the needs analysis or the needs pyramid that we are dealing with survival. And Black men in particular are always in that mode it takes a lot more for us to get to the other levels, which is, you know, significance and belonging and contribution. And so what I have been doing, Michael, is I'm currently working on, and by the way, I just started not too long ago. I, I fired corporate America earlier this year. So my business officially as a coach is still new, though I've been coaching for a long while informally, right? Um, so one of the things that I've done is I've always incorporated coaches myself. So right now I literally have paid, uh, I have four paid coach, four coaches on my payroll for different areas of my development. And one has been around a mentor coach friend, um, Jim Rohn's own mentee for the last year. Uh, I love him dearly. And what I'm doing, Michael, is I'm exposing men to a better quality of life, starting with, um, non-threatening areas such as do-it-yourself online courses. Um, I'm, I'm about to launch a course in two weeks, actually, on men who are going through needing changes in terms of the career or the workplace. Um, and, and my hope is to help those men feel satisfied and ask for more, because the three areas that I focus on right now in terms of transition, uh, which are typically crisis areas for men, our career, relationships, and health. And, um, you know, I've been through all of those rock bottoms. And so from my own experience, which is one of the best way I think I touch people that I know through experience, uh, I can talk it and because I've walked it, but also through the studies. I'm, I, you know, um, it's, it's not easy, Michael. And as you can tell, you know, we have to get very creative in terms of how we you know, we, we, we recruit these brothers, our friends, our brothers. So the challenge exists. Yeah, but the good news is I have noticed, again, I've been writing for 25 years and I remember when I first started writing, uh, if you went to a bookstore and if you go to, they didn't even have a section for men. It de definitely didn't even have a session for black men. I mean, if you go, if you went to a bookstore, you went to African American, they have African American studies and they'd be talking about racism and, and all of that. But there were no personal development, motivational, positive books for black men. Mm -hmm. And that's why I decided in 1995, I wrote my first book. It was called Brothers Are You Listening? A Success Guide for the New Millennium. Powerful book, still, still selling them. Michael, I got to pick up some of these books, man. So before we're done, you know, let's connect on that. Absolutely. So, but the point that I want to make is that as Black men, it is now up to us to engage in this personal development space, learning how to become the best version of ourselves, which has nothing to do with our ethnicity. But what I have recognized is marketing to Black men is kind of challenging. Uh, so you have to kind of be creative in, in, in how to get their attention. So when I, when I launched the Shadow the Stereotypes movement, it was something that all Black men could relate to, you know, because we all know the stereotypes that we see about us. And so when you say Shadow those Stereotypes, Black men go, ah, okay, I can relate to that. So it's, it's, it's made it a little easier uh, 
to get in alignment with this process. And I recently launched uh, my annual summit. It's called Shattered the Stereotypes Empowerment Summit. And it's a 12 session summit specifically for black men. And matter of fact, my next summit, I definitely want to have you as a part of it as one of the speakers. Thank you. Uh, which will be wonderful. But it's really about providing resources for black men, because I think there are a lot of black men who are ready for this, but they don't even know this stuff exists. They don't even know what personal development means. They don't, you know, they've never engaged in coaching or therapy or anything. So again, that's why I launched this program or this platform to expose black men to some of the things that are available to us. Now, with that being said though, you know, one of the greatest challenges we're gonna have in our lifetime are relationships, uh -huh. marriages, you know, relationships. And so you, you, know, you shared a little bit about yours, but I just wanna kind of have a conversation because marriage is an important thing uh, in our lives. And a lot of times as men, I know that I've heard so many conversations of married men who are just miserable, just absolutely miserable in their marriages. And uh, I'm trying to change that. <laughs> I'm trying to let black men know that marriage can be and should be a wonderful, rewarding, fulfilling experience. Yeah. I've been blissfully married now for the past 19 years. Yeah. Um, but I've done a lot of work, you know, done a lot of yeah. my inner work that has allowed that to happen. But I want to just kind of let's, let's just talk about marriage. So first of all, tell me, how old were you the first time you got married? How old were you? So. So I had a common law marriage with um, the young lady I spoke to you about that we had the children for in New York. And that's because my first marriage was at 23. Okay. And uh, I was not ready for that, Michael. In fact, I got married for all the wrong reasons. And, 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 and really, uh, she was my first love, sweetheart at 16, and she immigrated to the United States. Um, she's deceased now. And when she came, I carried on with life and she uh, came back and saw how successful I was in the hotel industry um, and decided that she wanted, for other reasons, I think, to get married. But I also wanted for uh, the purpose of getting to the United States to be married, too. So we did it. And we had a huge wedding, cost a lot of money, and, um, you know, outfitted a beautiful home in uh, Long Island. And I got there and realized that she had uh, perhaps other interests. And so it didn't last at all. I, 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 you know, we dissolved that marriage and um, then I went, it, so it didn't last at all, literally. So I went to Aruba and started a business for a few years, just lived in the Caribbean. Um, then when I came back is when I met my ex and we got together. Um, we did everything that a couple would do, but I was married shy. I was so shy uh, because of what had happened before. And uh, uh, I'm now married happily for six years, celebrating my anniversary, the 21st, next week, actually, um, with a wonderful, wonderful partner. Yeah, now, see, you said something that's really important. So for the audience, I want you to pay attention to this because <laughs> you and I did the exact same thing. I got married when I was 21 years old. <laughs> I was not ready to be married. Emotionally, I was too immature. Like yourself, I got married for all the wrong reasons. I got married because I was climbing the corporate ladder and I wanted to look mature and responsible because I thought that would help me climb the corporate ladder, you know, because this young black guy, you know, that was single probably would be less yeah. likely to, to move up the corporate ladder. So it was, it was, I was actually trapped on that societal roller coaster. And that roller coaster says to be successful, you got to have the house, the wife, the 2.5 kids and all of that, right? Yes, sir. So again, I was too young, too emotionally immature, and got married for all the wrong reasons. So as you're watching this, I want you to think about, if you're thinking about getting married, ask yourself honestly, why? <laughs> why are you choosing to do this? Now, again, I think marriage is a wonderful thing when done right. I mean, I tell you, I, I love being married. But as mentioned, I got married for the wrong reasons at the beginning. And it ultimately ended in divorce. And we don't talk openly about divorce. So Wayne, I want to kind of shift a little bit because first lesson, guys, don't get married for the wrong, 
reasons, be mature. But let's, let's talk about divorce because I know for me, my divorce was one of the most devastating events of my life. And what really hurt the most for me was it was the first time I actually really failed at something. <laughs> and that sense of failure just really cut me like a knife. And I really struggled with the whole, because my whole identity was wrapped up into being a manager, being a Papa. husband and all of that. And so when I lost that, it's like my sense of identity sort of collapsed. Yes, sir. And so I know, I do believe everything happens for a reason, okay? But the lesson, I, I want to share the lesson, the lesson that I learned in my divorce or as a result of my divorce was that I had to be willing to unpack some emotional baggage yes, sir. that kept me from creating intimacy and connection in my relationships. So with that being said, I just want to, what was the most difficult part for you, Wayne, in going through a divorce? The most difficult part uh, was being separated from my kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I, even with the arrangement where every other weekend you meet, I was present and prepared to have them. I was persistent. I wanted them every week if I could, every day even. And because I ran, like I said, a, uh, a children's center, it just so happened that it was a relief to the moms <clears throat> to have the kids spend their summers with me. So summer was mine. I had them, you know, traverse in all of New York City every summer um, on the tours and trips that we did and all the activities we did. So that made up for that. But the hardest part was really just not having access when I wanted to my children. Yeah. Yeah. And that for me, my greatest fear was that my former wife would get involved with someone that would mistreat my children. Yes. That was, that was terrifying to me. Yes. I just, just, oh my gosh, I struggled with that so much because that was my, one of my greatest fears. Yes. Um, yeah. So <laughs> when you go through a divorce, whether you will admit it or not, it is painful. And unfortunately, a lot of men immediately after divorce will jump right into another relationship. Now, I didn't make that mistake, thank God. Uh, but how difficult was it for you, Wayne, to start dating after your divorce? You know, I will say this. I don't know that I've ever been truly alone. I I've always jumped from one relationship to another. And part of it is because uh, I hadn't yet grappled with me. And so there was fear to be alone because then I saw a lot of ugly truth. And so it was important to, to reconcile those, those ugly parts that I hadn't worked through yet on Wayne by having what I thought was love from somebody else or admiration or attention and so forth. Um, so I kind of rebounded with the uh, mother of my child that was outside of the relationship after the divorce. Um, the, the major, major breakup, separation. And um, that didn't last because it wasn't substantial. It wasn't on anything. And so for the first time after that, I had to stop. And then I was alone, you know? Um, and that was painful, very painful. I hurt a lot. But in the hurting, Michael, I found a lot of resiliency, strength. I was able to have a first time close up look at myself and, uh, and see where I stunk and had to clean a lot of closet, man. And, um, you know, today I feel like a bigger, better, bolder man as a result of having those truths. But it's not easy, but I think we have to get to the place where we have to have that honest one-on-one -on -one discussion with ourselves and call it for what it is. And it's not like social media. You, when you have that discussion, you, there are no filters. There are no taking of six shots to choose the right one. There are no posing beside a Lamborghini and saying it's yours. It's the real old deal, McNeil. And, uh, you know, it makes you um, evaluate. And you talked about identity. You know, uh, the platform, the signature platform that I use in my work is called VIP. 
It's really focused on identifying core values, sense of identity, which is deep stuff and aligning that with purpose. And so I had to go through those before I could really, really teach it. And, uh, you know, values in terms of the values that my parents laid down with me that I rejected all those years, they came back up when I was alone. I had to call on them. They were my strengths. And the sense of self, identity. I realized that who I was and what I was meant to be was not this, you know. And so to, to honestly be in alignment with that, Michael, meant I had to kick myself in the ass a few times. And then, only then, did I see how I could move towards purpose. Yeah, and again, this, this is a journey. And, you know, we live in this quick fix, instant gratification society. Everybody wants it now, now, now. This is work. <laughs> it takes work. effort to be willing to look at, and shall I say, unpack the emotional baggage that we're carrying around. So for me, um, my <clears throat> transformational journey began as a result, like yourself, of pain. I was in so much pain, I didn't have a choice. It was either get help or die, <laughs> period. So I gained the courage like yourself to go to therapy, which began that process for me. But then I just, I just made a conscious choice. I said, you know, if I don't do anything else in my life, I am going to figure out how to create a great relationship. Yeah. I, it's just, I just made a conscious choice. Now, it took me a minute because, as a matter of fact, I took a five-year, five-year vow of celibacy. Wow. Because I was so committed to dealing with my stuff, yeah. I knew that I couldn't do that with someone else. Yeah. I needed to just clean up my act. I needed to really get honest with myself. And so, again, it was a challenging process. Um, workshops, seminars. I've read literally hundreds of books. Uh, meditation, just, just really transforming myself from the inside out. And as a result of that commitment, as mentioned, I found the love of my life. And again, we've been, been together 21 years, happily married for 19. So it's a process, men, that we have to be willing to go through. But rest assured, if you're watching this, it's absolutely possible for you to create great relationships. Now, you may choose not to be married, but what I know that every man wants is we want connection. You see, we've been taught to believe that we have three primary responsibilities as men, what I call the three Ps, provide, right, procreate, and protect. But nobody taught us how to connect. And we have to understand that we can't be emotional or we can't be relational if we're unwilling to be emotional. So the key to creating great relationships is to get in touch with your emotions and who you are as a man. And so one way to do that is therapy. Uh, another way to do that is ha having a coach that supports and empowers you through some of the stuff. So I wanna move to the area of coaching, um, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about coaching and ways that you can move through areas of your life that maybe need to be transformed. Yes, sir. So we talked about marriage and divorce because that's, that's a really important piece, but there's also another piece that we as men may not talk about, which is feeling stuck or what you might call having a midlife crisis. So Wayne, can you share some of the some of the things that a man may be experiencing that may indicate that he's having that midlife crisis? What are some of the things a man may be going through? Yeah, he feels he feels not recognized and rewarded at work, like he's been doing this old job and it's just a matter of going through the motions. And you know, he's at a place where he has kids next door in the room that he can't communicate with. He's lost touch with them. He sees his wife as a roommate or his girlfriend. She's no longer that passionate, hot sex symbol that he saw uh, 10, five years ago. Um, he's worried because when he combs his hair, he sees it in a comb, not on his head, you know? <laughs> and and, and uh, he doesn't see his, his belt buckle as, as evidently as he used to five years ago. Um, 
you know, he, he begins to get this feeling of not enough, that there has to be more, that uh, when he compares himself with his peers, they seem to have gotten ahead where, whereas he has not done as much, you know? And so the hard thing about it is he can't make the decision to go. He, he, he stays where he is. He hasn't been able to build up enough girth. I don't know if I can say this on your show, enough balls. Yeah, he hasn't been able to do that, Michael, because he likes the certainty and the so-called security of what's familiar, but he knows there's more. So he, he's sunken into a place of almost isolation in his house. He's there, but feels he's not alone, but he feels lonely. And uh, oftentimes there is depression happening and he hasn't recognized it. Nobody has tapped it. He's just miserable. He cusses everybody. He blames everybody. Because again, like you and I said, he's not taken the step to look at himself honestly. And, um, you know, he's going through a crisis, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. It can be a transition. Absolutely. So I mentioned at the beginning that there are only two things that cause a man to want to change, pain and divine discontent. So when you're stuck in that crisis mode, Let's just call that divine discontent because life is supposed to be joyful. Yes, sir. Life is supposed to be fulfilling. Life shouldn't be this constant repetitive doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting something different to happen. The key is what I call transformation and transformation I define as the process from moving from who you thought you were supposed to be to who you were born to be. That's right. And so if you're ready to step into and begin that journey to become who you were born to be, a great way to do that could be using a coach. A coach can help guide you along this journey. So Wayne, tell us a little bit about your coaching services. Yeah, I, I'm happy to. See, every significant star or, or performer out there has a coach. You know, Michael Jordan didn't become as great as he is because of just his basic innate ability. He has to be, he has to be coached up. He looks at tapes with others and says, this is where I go wrong and this is how I correct it. And the coach doesn't have to always be uh, potentially in the same space you are in terms of greater than you are, but the coach can recognize as a third party. What the coach does is looks at your blind spots. You know, the coach is like your rear view mirror with that extra uh, piece to see the blind spots because we have them. We just don't know. We're going along until we hit the most cycle because we missed it. And that's too late when that happens. That's the crisis. So what I do as a coach is I work on strengths though, Michael. And you know, I, I see my wife in her work sometimes when she's working from the office. She spends a lot of time uh, unraveling past pain and it, traumas. And that's part of therapy. As a coach, I, I may visit it for information, but I don't stay there. I go with the here and now. So we live in the now uh, in my practice. And the future, which is promised to us, is beautiful because it shows trajectory but we create the future by, again, working on the nows. And so, you know, it's, it's about creating uh, mindset and habits, behaviors that in the now will take you based on your strengths to where you need to be. So ideally, what happens is I look at folks at where they are, figure out where they want to be, and that's the gap, right? And we have to figure out how we're going to close this gap. In fact, sometimes we have to figure out if you have the right gaps because your ideals may not be correct. You may be misinformed. Somebody else may have included for you what your values are, your sense of self. A lot of us live with our parents' idea of who we are and the values, and it's not ours or the media, right? So I do a lot of work with getting people to tell me why they're here or why they need a help to get to the next level. And sometimes the discontent is not even worth it. We have to reevaluate what that is. 
And so I look at what's called limiting beliefs. The reasons why we haven't gotten there is no reason but our own. We can blame the weather, we can blame the sun, the star, the moon, but ultimately we're responsible. It's the buck stops with I am. So when we dispel the myths and all the limiting beliefs, which spends, which is a bit of work, we then create new belief systems that are uh, empowering for you. We create new ideas of what your outcome should be. And when we talk about outcome, we're not talking about some pie in the sky. We mean, what does it feel like, look like, smell like, taste like, so that when you get there, you know you've gotten it. And we have the men, or I have the men, uh, communicate what that would look like for them. And then we spend some time looking at core values, like I said, to break down anything. You know, a lot of people, Michael, if I said, what's important to you? And most of your clients would say money. Well, money we know is truly a value, but it's not the core value. It's a mean value to something else. Maybe money means liberty. Maybe it means power. Maybe it means um, you know ability to do something else. The other aspect of what I look at when I uh, work with gentlemen is identity. You know, the idea of who you want to be, your self ideal. Now, this may be somebody real or imaginary, but it's 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 for you an aspiration. It's where you want to wind up. And in my case, my dad was part of my ideal, but I had other men participating, you know, uh, along the way to create that image. But where I was, was not where I wanted to be. So there was a gap. And what I do is help men to identify where they are, true, true, the true, true, and create a path to get the gap filled to where you want to be. That's work. So it's not simply just meeting with me. The work is still, the onus of the work is on the brothers to get it done. But I always get them to look for an accountability partner. This is somebody who's going to kick your ass. Not somebody who's going to say to you, yeah, I understand, I understand. Somebody's going to say, yo, bro, you got to do it. You know, it's up to you if it's to be. And they have to introduce that accountability partner to me so that we know it's the real deal. Yeah. Um, and, and lastly, I think, once you have a sense of value, it drives your belief system, identity, it drives how you show up. And we then do the most difficult part of the work, which is to align those with purpose. What is your mission? And that's an assignment. And I think we're all born into an assignment and a mission, but most of us spend our life missing it. We, we go for what's convenient or what looks good, we just missed it. And so this work is something that spends uh, a lot of energy to discover. But once you figure it out, it's easy sailing. Yeah. And the people, places, things, and, and, and resources that you need are attracted to you. So to wind up, Michael, what I do really is an inner game. I'm not so dependent on having resources, uh, external resources, like you don't have to have a car or money or home to make yourself a greater, bigger, better man, but you have to be resourceful. It's resourcefulness, how you use what you have. And that's what I help them to do. Nice. And that's the key to transformation. Yeah. Having that coach that can, again, look at your blind spots, help you see the things that you can't see, and then give you some tools to help move you in the direction to get where you want to be. They can't do the work for you. You gotta do the work yourself. But having that coach to, to light that fire underneath you, to guide you, to make sure that you're staying on the right track, that's how you create an extraordinary life. So again, it's there's no shortcuts to this. No, <laughs> not at all. I've been doing this for 25 years and I'm still learning, I'm still growing. Yes, sir. But I also know that I would not be where I am today without coaches without someone in my corner giving me some knowledge and wisdom to help me along the way. So with that being said, Wayne, how can people reach out to you if they're interested in working with you? Yeah, um, so let me um, give you, my website is viptransformativeliving.com. And there'll be, um, a, there'll be a link below the video also. So I'll have that link available. Okay, and I have all of the, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, Facebook is VIP Transformative Living LLC. It's coachwayne.vip on Instagram, and it's Wayne Dawson on, uh, on LinkedIn. 
my, my number, office number is 954-300-2004. And my email address is Wayne Dawson at viptransformativeliving.com. Perfecto. All right, so here's your opportunity to share some, some closing thoughts and wisdom with the audience. Yeah, and Michael, let, let me just plug, I would inc encourage folks to send me their email just so that I can keep them up to speed with what's coming. Like I said, I have a course coming on. It's a six-week transformational course helping brothers who are stuck in terms of the world of work or career to get over, um, probably make some more money, but certainly to be seen and heard. Um, and I wanted to just, and I'm writing a book, Michael, uh, When the Shift Hits the Man, and it's really, I haven't created the subtitle, but it's really exactly what we talked about, helping brothers to understand how to keep the peace and avoid the baby mama drama, right? Anyway, um, closing thoughts. I think we should get out of our heads the idea that real men don't ask for help, that there's something sissified or not masculine when we reach out and ask for help and I believe uh, vulnerability, real men cry. Um, a good tear, you know, I think helps us to dispel some of the anger and frustration that we may feel. And why shouldn't we? You know, we have been a people at war in this country and all over the world. And so that brings pain. Um, we have seen a lot of pain, destruction, domination, and death in our communities. And so it's time for us to build and collaborate and construct. And um, I think reach out. And again, so we can't do it alone. Like my father taught me, like my industries that I've worked taught me, it's about collaboration. If we're gonna build this nation, it's one brick at a time and it starts with self. Get yourself a coach, you know, get yourself a coach. There you go, there you go. Well, my closing thought is simple. If you don't go within, you will always go without. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Transformation is the process of going within. It has nothing to do with the color of your skin. It has nothing to do with your age. It has everything to do with your willingness and your ability to tap into your mind and your heart, because that's where that is the source of your true power. So if you've been struggling with connecting with that, give Wayne a holler. Let him coach you through how to connect to that and create the life you know you deserve. All right, man. Well, Wayne, brother, thank you so much. I love you. Appreciate you joining the, the movement, thank man. You, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have you on the Shadow of the Stereotypes team. So this is just the first of many collaborations. So I feel blessed that we were introduced. And I don't believe in accidents. Everything happens for a reason. So I'm really looking forward to see what the universe serves up for us next. So thanks. Brother for Mike. Thank you so much for having me. Boomeranging back all the love and respect and admiration. You do great work. We got to stay in touch. There you go. All right. So this has been another episode of Shatter the Stereotypes. So go out there and do that. Shatter the Stereotypes. Create an extraordinary life. It's, it's available to you. We'll see you next episode. Take care. I'll see you in a while. Thank you. <laughs>